Good evening and welcome to our first edition of USA Hockey Officiating Education's program's Zoomcast. My name is Scott Zelkin and I'll be your moderator and host for this evening's presentation. Each Tuesday, we plan on bringing you an hour-long webinar aimed at informing and educating not only USA Hockey's officials, but the larger USA Hockey membership. Our topics will be geared towards officials, but we hope that each episode we present will have some takeaways for everyone within the USA Hockey family. This week, we're gonna be discussing USA Hockey's renewed initiative geared towards abuse and zero tolerance. To do that, I'm being joined by three individuals who are playing a key role in bringing this initiative back to the forefront of the organization's consciousness. Our first panelist, coming from the great state of Montana, is Al Bloomer. Al has been a volunteer with USA Hockey for over 40 years, including time spent as our national coach in chief. Al is currently a member of the Plain Rules Committee and has been a driving force behind this updated initiative. Al, I'd like to welcome you this evening. What, uh, what caused you to get involved with this particular topic at this particular time? Well, thanks, Scott, and uh, I welcome everybody on board. It, it really uh, is an interesting story. My life has been in coaching um, for most of my career with USA Hockey. And what got me uh, started on this is uh, I have a grandson who uh, started as a referee as at age 12. And after he got his level one, uh, he went, and was doing a, a, a game and uh, <clears throat> he got yelled at by some fans and a coach and he called me on the phone and he said grandpa he said you're in the coaching program what's going on here it's no fun and that's what got me started and uh, and so i got a hold of dave labuda and we brought it up to the uh, playing rules committee about three years ago and here we are that's great. And uh, speaking of Dave Labuda, he's our next panelist. Dave, uh, as many of you know, is our current national referee in chief. And much like Al, he's a member of the Plain Rules Committee. He's also been a volunteer for many level or on many levels for USA Hockey, though he's a little less experienced than Al because he's only been doing it for about 30 years. <laughs> um, while you, Dave, while you've been working on this project with Al for quite a while, um, before we really dig into it, any thoughts you want to you want to offer uh, at the beginning here? Um, my thoughts. Well, first of all, it's great to have Al joining us. Um, you know, you don't always hear coaches joining officials to address a problem, but Al has been a big supporter of this effort um, over the last uh, for quite some time. Actually, we've been tracking the rise in uh, the abuse issues when it comes to officials and. Um, over the last several years, there's been a market increase in, in the verbal abuse towards officials and uh, some of it even escalating to the physical abuse of officials. And we just felt uh, the time had come um, that we had to address this not only as a program, but also as an organization. And here we are. Uh, that's awesome. And, and finally, Matt Leaf is also joining us as part of this panel this evening. And as many of you know, Matt is USA Hockey's director of the officiating education program. And, and within that role, he is involved in every aspect of USA Hockey's education and development of its officials. Additionally, Matt is the father of two teenage sons who play and officiate. Matt, welcome and uh, anything you'd like to offer as we begin. Yeah, thanks, Scott. And I want to uh, thank uh, both Al and Dave uh, not only Al for being the one that uh, spearheaded this thing really uh, three years ago and, and kept on the Plain Rules Committee uh, to, uh, to, to make a commitment uh, to this particular issue, but it, it has evolved over that time. And, and um, I, I think it is, it is a very uh, important time for USA Hockey. Uh, as you're going to learn here, uh, the retention of officials is a uh, significant issue that, that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and one uh, of the many reasons as to why retention is an issue is the abuse factor. So we have the commitment. We, uh, we presented to the uh, uh, general membership at our winter meeting down in Orlando in, uh, in uh, January, some data and some information and some examples of, of the challenges that we face. And uh, we're very happy to, to find out that we got 100% support from our organization at that time uh, to move forward with uh, uh, with uh, an updated zero tolerance initiatives initiative, 
and also some additional educational materials that will be uh, coming uh, throughout the course of the summer and prior to the next season um, as resources to address the abuse issues. So I'm happy to be here tonight and, and discuss this very important topic, uh, not only to the officiating program, but to the organization as a whole. And also uh, certainly want to thank uh, those that uh, tuned in tonight to our first uh, Zoomcast. Uh, we hope you enjoy the discussion and the uh, presentation and very much look forward to uh, you being a uh, active part of uh, these uh, programs in the uh, coming weeks. Uh, that's great. Um, and as we begin, I want to acknowledge that we have two groups of viewers out there tonight. Uh, we have a, a, a segment of you that have tuned in and, and our registration numbers uh, were a few hundred of you that had registered. Um, the, the webinar portion from Zoom has room for 100, 100 people to watch. Those 100 people will be able to actively participate through interactive features, such as at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Uh, we will be taking questions in a little bit, so you can use that function um, to, to submit some questions, and I'll be uh, picking out some really good ones and, and throw it to the panel to discuss. Um, and then also, you'll have the ability to answer some poll questions, which we're gonna, we're gonna get to in a moment. Um, the second group are all watching right now on YouTube Live. And unfortunately, because it's uh, you through YouTube Live, you can't actively interact with us through submitting questions and whatnot. Um, but I want to, once again, as Matt said, thank everybody for tuning in. We are really excited about this, this feature, these Zoomcasts. Um, our goal is to have them happen every Tuesday. Uh, running all the way through the hockey season uh, on a continuous basis. And, and we really felt abuse and zero tolerance was, was really the way we wanted to kick this off. So with that, we're going to ask a few questions of the audience. So there's five questions. I'm going to put it up on the screen. You'll be able to respond. There are five questions. Um, it, it shouldn't take too long to answer them. So I will we'll spend a minute or so. Um, giving you the opportunity to vote here. Uh, the questions, as an official, have you ever been physically assaulted before, during, or after a game? As an official, have you ever been verbally threatened before, during, or after a game? If you answered yes to question one or question two, did you report the incident? If you didn't report the incident, what was your reason? And if you reported the incident, did you receive some sort of follow-up feedback or resolution? So I can see some of you have already uh, um, have already started to to vote. So let's uh, let's see what the results come in, and then we'll share this. Uh, we'll share it in a second here. And the Zoomcast production studio doesn't have the ability to play the uh, uh, play the the Jeopardy music as we're doing this. And we're seeing a couple of comments um, for question number four, which is if you did not report the incident, what were your reasons? Obviously you can't answer number four if, um, uh, if you did report it. So I'm honestly not sure if it'll allow you to submit without skipping that question, but you can always just put you're not an official on that part of it. So we'll give it about 30 more seconds because honestly, 79, 80 of you, we have almost full participation here. Just a couple of more seconds. All right, we're gonna end this. And let's see what the survey says. Okay, so let's share the results real quick. So you should all be able to see, as an official, have you ever been physically assaulted before, during, or after a game? 26% of you said yes. As an official, have you been verbally threatened before, during, or after a game? 67% of you said yes. 
Okay, did you report the incident to someone? 56% of you said yes, 30% of you said no. And then we already know that number four is a tough question for a lot of you. And then if you reported the incident, did you receive some sort of follow-up follow or feedback? And it's almost 50-50, but 42% of you said yes. So, you know, that's, that's some in interesting feedback. And, and with that now, I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to ask, uh, ask Dave, are you able to see the PowerPoint presentation? I am. Okay. So with that now, let's, uh, let's get started. So did you know USA Hockey adds 9,500 new officials every season? Unfortunately, 50% of those don't return for season two. And within five years, 7,600 of those original 9,500, which is 80%, are no longer officiated. So we're losing 80% of our new officials after five years. And obviously, organizationally, for officiating, that's, that's a challenge. The top two reasons officials don't return, number one, and, and for the purpose of this, is verbal, mental, and physical abuse. Number two, lack of games. That's, that's a really important topic and, and certainly something uh, organizationally, we are going to focus on, and it is going to be a topic of a future Zoom pass. However, today, we're going to focus on reason number one. Um, and, and I think we all know a few, abuse just isn't a hockey problem. It's a societal problem. Uh, we see videos, posts all the time of different sports officials being abused physically, verbally by players, coaches, parents, all of that stuff. And and as Matt said, and, and Al and Dave have also said, USA Hockey as an organization has made a commitment to, to work on the abuse issue. Um, retention of officials is a huge issue within the organization. And if the number one issue is, zero, is uh, abuse, the organization has made a commitment to really focus on that. So here's what the policy is right now. And, and I'm not going to give you everything, but I'm going to give you some of it. So USA Hockey is committed to creating a safe and fair environment for all participants. Respect for the game, the opponents, coaches, and officials is a critical part of the environment that is created. And this zero tolerance policy summarizes the required actions to be taken when violations occur. So, so ultimately, this is a guideline for, for officials when they're on the ice or when they're at the rink. Um, all players, coaches, officials, team officials, parents must maintain a sportsmanlike and educational atmosphere before, during, and after all USA hockey sanctioned games. Thus, the following points of emphasis must be implemented by all USA hockey participants and spectators. For players, and, and we'll talk about players, coaches, spectators, and uh, officials here. So this is, this is really rule 601 for everybody watching. Uh, a minor penalty for unsportsmanlike conduct shall be assessed whenever a player openly disputes or argues any decision by an official, uses obscene or vulgar language, including swearing, even if it's not directed at a particular person, and visually demonstrates any sign of dissatisfaction with an official's decision. Minor penalty is assessed in this case. If the player continues with that, then they would be assessed a misconduct, and after that, a game misconduct. So I'm going to show you a quick video here, and then and then we'll uh, we'll offer it up to Dave for for a quick comment. And I, what I would ask is focus on the player who's getting a penalty and how he reacts with the referee on the far side of the ice. So the penalty is there. The whistle's blown. Now this player fires the puck over at the referee on the boards when he's upset. So Dave, how would an action such as this fit into the policy? And what are we looking for? Well, clearly what we're looking for to the best of our ability is to judge intent here. Uh, I mean, and, and that goes into a, a couple of different factors. First of the age, the age division here. I mean, are, are, is this age division really, are, are, is their intent to uh, really shoot the puck at the referee or is the player simply trying to be helpful? He knows he committed a penalty and he's just trying to give the, the referee an opportunity to pick up the puck a little quicker. 
I mean, I think the one thing that as officials we always need to do is take in the entirety of the situation, taking into consideration all the factors at that moment in time before we make a decision. And of course, though, that sounds like a lot to have to digest in fractions of a second, but that's what we have to do. And so I would, I would say in that specific situation, that player isn't shooting the puck over to the referee so he can pick it up. That, to me, looks like dissatisfaction with the call. And another topic we're going to be covering in future Zoomcasts is communication. But if I'm watching that official and observing that official, I believe that's a very good example of a time where a minor penalty should be assessed to that player. Matt, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I would agree with that, Scott. I think the other thing we have to keep in mind is I know that uh, uh, just kind of sort of watching some of the chats and stuff like that to go through, um, you know, there's a sense that uh, if, if we really want to strictly enforce this policy, that there's going to be a double minor penalty every time a penalty is assessed uh, because players react to the fact that penalties be called. I think the key to this is, look, the quality official is going to have to uh, be able to differentiate between emotion, okay, and uh, an actual abuse. And the reality is, is that hockey is a very emotional game, okay, and players and coaches are going to react emo emotionally, okay, but when they react emotionally, are they yelling at the sweater or are they doing something at the sweater as, as, as a reaction to something just in general, or are they specifically singling out that official? Okay, for abuse. And if they're singling out that official, uh, that would be uh, very, very uh, important in terms of uh, setting a tight standard as it relates to the uh, unsportsmanlike conduct policies and, and uh, the rules that govern unsportsmanlike conduct. If it's just a quick emotional response, because that's the way the game is, you know what, we can be a little bit more uh, lenient in that regard because they're not, they're not focusing directly at the official. It's just an emotional response uh, to, uh, to what was happening and to a very emotional game at that particular time. So that's, a, that's part of the success. But the bottom line is that uh, the officials have to be able to understand the spirit and the intent of the rules. And in order to gain credibility, uh, they also need to be able to properly apply uh, the, uh, the rules uh, according to what uh, Rule 601 um, has to offer from USA Hockey. Use that as part of your toolbox and uh, something that is a uh, uh, as part of your toolkit. Excellent. So now let's talk to coaches. We'll get into, into Al's uh, area of expertise here. Uh, and once again, for coaches, it's, it's very similar and it's found under 601. A minor penalty for unsportsmanlike conduct shall be assessed whenever a coach openly disputes or argues any decision by an official, uses obscene or vulgar language in a boisterous manner to anyone, visually displays any sign of dissatisfaction with the official's decision, including standing on the boards or standing in the bench doorway with the intent of inciting the officials, players, or, spectacle, or, or spectators, maybe creating a spectacle. Anytime that coach persists in any of these actions, he shall be assessed a game misconduct. So after the minor penalty, our next step is a game misconduct. Al, any, uh, any thoughts you want to add in terms of how officials might look towards this and, and talking with coaches and everything else? Well, one, one of the challenges here is with our younger officials doing the might squirt and peewee games with an older coach. And that, and that dynamic gets really difficult with a really young official. I think like 40% of our officials right now are under the age of 18. So that dynamic is, is an issue as they get older. Um, what the coach is the role model and, and the coaches get excited and we talk about this in our coaching education all the time. And there has to be communication. Uh, a coach should be able to respectfully question a call. There's a way to do that if the coach is uh, not setting a good example. Um, I think the official gives them a, a, a warning uh, back in the day to put the hand up and say, okay, coach, you know, I got the message. And then if he continues, then obviously uh, the two minute minor and then go, go, hope, hopefully doesn't escalate to the misconduct. 
but the coach sets the example. He's the role, he or she are the role model on that bench and the players will follow the behavior and the attitudes of the coach as well as the spectators. And we talk about that more and more in our coaching education program. And I noticed somebody asked a question about should officials be involved in, in, our, in our seminars? And the answer is absolutely yes, particularly at the, at the three, four, and five. Uh, levels. No, that, that's great. And, and I think, Al, you, you really hit on a, an important part of that. Um, the dynamic of younger official, older coach. It's a tough position to put in and to ask a, a 14, 15, 16 year old official to go over to a 40 year old, 50 year old coach and tell that coach that they need to stop yelling and screaming or questioning calls and things like that. And, and I think you know, the one thing I'd want to offer to, to those of you in the audience, um, you know, if you're in a situation as an older official or a more experienced official with a younger official that you're working with, you have to take control of that. And, and that warning is really important. And, and Dave, you'll, you'll, I'm going to hope, would agree with this. But if you don't tell a coach he's out of line, he's not going to know to stop. And, and providing that warning and putting them on notice is – is really gonna gonna set the example or set the line in the sand that says you can't cross this, right, Dave? Dave is Dave is gone, so I think his internet is off. He's in northern northern Wisconsin. Al, yeah, could I add one other thing here? I think part of and Matt touched on it a little bit earlier is that one of the things that's in our revised zero tolerance that could help this situation is that we are strongly recommending that prior to the drop of the puck at the beginning of the game, the official makes some effort to go over and introduce himself to the coach, chit chat with him, and then put a, a little bit of a relationship there, just, you know, 20, 30, 40 seconds, that type of thing. And that begins that respect issue and that dialogue issue. No, for sure. That's, that's great. Um, so now, even though this is under coaches, and this is really important, and I'm gonna ask Matt to comment on this in a second. In addition, any player coach who uses language that's offensive, hateful, or discriminatory in nature, anywhere in the rink before, during, or after the game shall be penalized under 601E3, which is a match penalty. Such behavior is represent, re reprehensible and has absolutely no place in our game. Uh, Matt, you wanna offer any comments? Yeah, I want to go back just a quick second and just touch base on, on the, the topic of, of the officials introducing themselves to the coach. Look, it doesn't have to be a lengthy conversation, but it does also allow you that opportunity to establish what the expectations are. Exactly. Okay, and especially the expectations as it relates to a communication part. And, and I don't want to steal Scott's thunder because the communication is going to be the, uh, uh, the next Zoom cast next week and get into that. But it is important that uh, uh, the rules establish what the expectations are. And in the case of, of introducing yourself to the coach, that's your opportunity to establish what the, what the line is, what the expectation is. And then you have to have the ability to, and the, the skill set to be able to back that up. As it relates to the hateful discriminatory language, uh, as you know, uh, our president uh, of USA Hockey sent out a directive uh, on October 31st of last season, 2019, that made uh, any use of uh, uh, hateful or discriminatory language in nature anywhere in the rink before, during, or after the game, make it an automatic match penalty that required a hearing. The bottom line is that USA Hockey needs to be inclusive. It needs to involve everyone who has an interest in the game in order to grow the game. And uh, this particular uh, directive is an important part moving forward. The good thing is, as we track the data, uh, for the most part, the officials got much better as it created awareness in, in properly enforcing this rule. But once again, I think we have to distinguish what the spirit and the intent is, okay? And hateful discriminatory is something that's geared towards race or ethnicity. It's something that's geared towards gender. It's something that gear, that's geared towards disability. Um, or something that's geared towards uh, homophobic uh, sexual orientation type things. 
uh, simply saying um, you suck ref um, does not fall under that hateful or discriminatory. It is absolutely 100% inappropriate and deserves the appropriate penalty to be assessed. Uh, and most likely a, a bench minor, if it's a coach initially, or a uh, misconduct player, misconduct for a player, but it does not fall under that. So uh, one of the initiatives or one of the things that we're trying to work on through the education process this season um, is, is really buttoning down and eliminating this part uh, or these particular actions from the game and in eliminating those actions, we have to be accurate in terms of our assessment. And um, Scott, can I add something to that? Please. Um, this, is, this is important because a lot of times, unfortunately, um, this happens without the officials actually hearing it. And I wanna re remind everybody on the, uh, on the webinar that you know, we have a, a procedure that if the officials don't hear it, but it is reported to them, that they then have a process to report it to both coaching benches and to put them on notice that this has been reported to them. And obviously, hopefully that will also then raise their awareness level even more for anything that might happen after that point. Oh, that's, that's, uh, that's fantastic. And that's, that's really important information. Um, and we've gotten a couple of questions. I'm, some really good questions are coming in through the Q&A in the chat section. I am gonna hold those till we kind of work our way through this, but within about 10 minutes, we're gonna, we're gonna take some questions that I think will be really good on this subject and, and some others in terms of players and whatnot. Um, so as I continue to navigate my screen here, parents, Favorite part at times, parents are expected to be a positive role model by treating all players, coaches, officials, and fellow spectators with, with respect and support. The game will be stopped. And, and this is important um, because I'm not sure all of our officials understand the correct procedures here, but the game will be stopped by game officials when a parent or spectator is displaying inappropriate and disruptive behavior or interferes with other spectators or the game. The game, game officials will identify the violators to the coach for the purpose of removing the parent or spectator from the spectator's viewing area. Once removed, play will be resumed. Lost time will not be replaced and the violators may be subject to further disciplinary action by the local governing body. This inappropriate and disruptive behavior shall include use of obscene or verbal language in a boisterous manner to anyone at any time, taunting of players, coaches, officials, or other spectators, throwing of any objects in the spectator's viewing area, player's bench, penalty box, or on the ice surface, directed in any manner to create a safety hazard. So I'm gonna show this, and this is an oldie but a goodie, and, and I'll show it a couple of times here, just, uh, this is, this is to the extreme, but I think um, as I'm currently a level two official, I've run into these problems as well on the ice. Okay, so. Scott, can I weigh in on this one? Absolutely, Al. There's a couple of things going on here and, and, and Matt again addressed the, again a little bit in the revised policy, but in my experience, a lot of the parent issues, particular, particularly at the uh, minor hockey, the mite, squirt, peewee, bantam, midget. I mean, when you get into juniors, it's a little different, but if the coach has a meeting with the parents on a regular basis, once or twice a year, explaining to them at that time what the behaviors are, what the expectations are. Um, <clears throat> I think it goes a long way to address uh, behavior of, of youth hockey parents. And again, I strongly believe that the parents are gonna follow the example of the coach. 
And if the coach keeps his cool, the coach is disciplined, you tend to have the parents and the spectators disciplined. Um, rinks are very skeptical. We've mentioned it a couple of times to have rink owners, rink managers, monitor spectators. And, and they are, are hesitant to do that because they're the customer and all the, those issues. So we've talked a little bit about having uh, monitors uh, that are volunteer monitors to do that. I think that's a good idea. Um, but I think a lot of it goes back to the, the expectation and the tone that the coach set with his parents and then people will follow the good example. Scott, can I jump in here? Of course. Um, uh, the, the points that Al makes are, are, are absolutely uh, correct, is if the, care, if the coaching uh, staff and even the, 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 the association, the team association is proactive in setting guidelines for the parents, that goes a long ways to hopefully circumvent some of that, this kind of behavior. This is, in, to some degree, at one point in time, what we saw was an extreme example of the behavior, but unfortunately, I think it's become more commonplace than we care to admit. Now, that being said, I don't want uh, officials to, who are listening here to think that what we're saying is that we want you to also monitor what's going on in the, in, in the stands. Um, that's not what's being said here. What we're saying is that when the, when the behavior in the stands, whoever it may be, starts to have an impact on the game, that's when we as game officials have to take some kind of action. Now, you've laid out what the protocols are for taking that action. But again, you have to use your good judgment in deciding when does the behavior start impacting what's happening on the ice. Now, that's great. So here, here's, a, here's a question. What, what happens if you can't ID the spectator who's verbally, um, verbally abusive in the stance? Matt? <laughs> I think, first of all, you're going to have a pretty good idea in terms of who the uh, – uh, who that fan or that spectator is associated with. When you stop play, okay, you've, you've determined that uh, the actions in the stands has, has now impacted the game. And you stop play and you allow the clock to continue and it continues to run. That's why lost time will not be replaced. Okay. And then you go over to, the, to that coach of that particular team. He is now the one that's responsible for making sure that that spectator gets removed. If you're unsure as to who's involved and it involves both teams, okay, you go to both coaches and they figure it out. But the responsibility then lies on that team, okay, and those coaches to have those spectators removed before that game continues. And my guess is that they're probably going to jump on that pretty quickly because they want to get the game going as quickly as possible. Okay, so the bottom line is, is, you have a pretty good idea. You go to that coach. If you're not sure, you go to both coaches. They figure it out, and they get that person removed. Exactly. Add add you know, one thing here. I think, you know, I, I've never officiated a game, so it's hard for me to, to put myself in, in the audience's position here. But I think if you catch it early and, and you nip it early, because it's just like, they're just going to push the envelope as far as they can. And then you let it accelerate, 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 and it gets out of control. I think you need to, if there's misbehavior in the stands, I think if the officials uh, approach the coach, as Matt suggests, early on and, and get control of it, then they'll know where the line is and they won't cross it. Perfect. That's, that's great. Um, all right. So we've talked about players coaches, and spectators. Now let's talk about some of the responsibilities that, that we as officials have. And, and, and this uh, is, is as important as anything. Um, officials are required to conduct themselves in a business-like and sportsman-like, impartial and constructive manner at all times. The actions of an official must be above reproach. Actions such as baiting or inciting players or coaches are strictly prohibited. We're a fit, we are ambassadors of the game and must always conduct themselves or ourselves with this responsibility in mind. Um, I'll just, before we even show a video, uh, Dave or Matt, any, any thoughts? 
Well, I think it goes without question that the officials always have to make sure that they're conducting themselves in a very professional way. Um, and, and some of the ways to do that is obviously being very much aware of your environment and what's going on in that environment and doing whatever you can to avoid creating confrontational situations. I am in no way uh, insinuating that officials consciously do that, but many times what happens is that we um, put ourselves or in a situation that unconsciously now becomes a confrontation. Yep, and, and I think Dave's internet went out. Matt, anything yep. you want to add? Yeah, let me add to that. Uh, by virtue of our jobs as officials, we are all peacekeepers. Okay, that's, that's part of our role out there, especially when the game is intense, it is competitive, okay, and there is a lot of emotion. And once again, emotion doesn't necessarily uh, excuse improper behavior, okay, but we also have to understand and be able to read the temperature of the game. And our role as a peacekeeper is we need to de-escalate, do what we can and have that in our toolkit and have that in our tool box is one of our skill sets. We, doing that, we do that by not being a jerk, okay? We do that by listening more than we do by speaking. We do that by always starting out nice, okay? And we also do that with knowing the rules and applying the rules properly and having an accurate response to whatever occurs out on the ice. And by doing that, we're essentially creating credibility, we're establishing a presence and we're creating rapport. So the key for us, a big part of us is controlling our emotion. Because if, if the situation is starting to escalate, whether it's verbally or whether it's physically, okay, our ability to control our emotion and stay calm, okay, will allow us to, to de-escalate and bring that, that situation or bring the uh, temperature of the game back down to a manageable level. Oh, that, that's great. And, and I, I think, you know, as I look at this, you know, we have to be above reproach. If we expect to, um, to demand that coaches, players conduct themselves in an appropriate manner behind the bench or on the ice, we have to do the same thing. And, and I think the emotions can certainly, um, the emotions can certainly get to all of us at times. We've all been in situations when that happens, but, but ultimately we have to be, uh, we have to be the best behaved people on the ice. And I'm, uh, I'm going to play a video now real quick that I think is a good example of maybe us not meeting that standard. I'm going to show this one more time. And certainly the player that shoves the linesman here has no business doing that and absolutely should be assessed penalties that remove them from the game. However, I would say that's a pretty good example of an official that let the emotions of the situation get the best of them and uh, conveniently uses too much force trying to put the player well, in the area of the penalty box, but but I would say certainly um, intentionally puts the player into the glass there, and and that that's really something that we as officials have to be leery of, right, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. And look, uh, the bottom line is is USA Hockey is going to support you 100% by following the proper rule application and following the proper procedures and everything else is, that's going on. But that's a perfect example of controlling your own emotion, okay? Because in our procedures, we don't grab players' jerseys from behind, okay? And uh, it's not recommended to obviously push a player and those types of things. So that, by all means, does not excuse the player. It absolutely 100% does not excuse the player. That would be deemed to be a physical assault on an official, and that player deserves the minimum one-year suspension that is outlined by USA Hockey's bylaws. But once again, we have to ask ourselves, did the official in that case, did he de-escalate the situation or did he, did he escalate it? And, and that's where 
Um, there has to be some accountability on that part as well. And that's why we do have the procedures in place and the recommendations we have in place as it deals with uh, controlling emotions and handling players and, and procedures and those types of things. So again, it, it goes back to controlling one's emotions and not putting the official in a situation where they're escalating the situation and making it a little bit worse. Now uh, that that's that's great. Um, Al, any comments on on that? I know you're you're the coaching side of it, but I, I'm sure you know as a coach, you're going to appreciate it when a, an official conducts themselves in a professional manner. And at the same token, if an official doesn't conduct themselves in a professional manner, it's going to be really frustrating. Well, thanks, Scott. You know, there's a couple of things here. Number one. And, and you read some statistics there. We as coaches and, and players and parents just want the official to be as good as they possibly can be and as fair and call and, and call it the game as he sees it. And, and what's happened is we all want quality officiating uh, in the games. And one of the reasons we're in this um, situation on this retention is that because of our behaviors, whether it be players, parents, coaches, or whatever, we are driving that uh, young official away. And so the number of experienced officials is very low. So if coaches want quality officiating, they have to make sure that there's a, a respect issue there, a communication issue there as well. And on that film there, I, I don't know, that looked like an older age group, Bantam or, or Midget, um, Again, if that player behaves that way, whether he was, somebody has to control their emotion and be disciplined here. Now I'm the coach of that player. Um, he's gonna get more than a, a, the two minute or the misconduct from us. I mean, we're gonna sit down with him about his controlling his emotions at the, call, at the time of the game. That, that, that's great. Um, all right, so now let's, let's we, the questions have been rolling in and I also see there's been some really good dialogue um, we're not going to be able to get to everything, but, you know, I, I want to pull a few of these out um, that I think will be beneficial. And, and this one is, is really uh, a process question. Um, and it's, I'm looking for clarification on the point regarding the spectators that quote unquote lost time will not be replaced. Does that mean that if you stop the game due to spectator conduct that the clock should continue to run while the issue is being resolved? Yes. So the game clock runs. So you tell the score, if there's five minutes on the clock, keep the clock running? That is correct. And that's, that's the incentive to, uh, uh, to have the coaches uh, and those that are responsible to uh, act quickly and to uh, get the situation resolved so the game can continue at that point. But that's the spirit and the intent of how the original zero tolerance policy was written back in 1993. Um, and that uh, still is still is in effect and still is in play right now. Okay, excellent. Another question here. What do I do if I'm approached by a coach after the game or in between periods while I'm trying to walk to my dressing room? I don't necessarily want to have a long drawn out conversation, but I don't want to ignore them either. What, what steps should I take and where's the line that I should draw? Uh, if you want, I'll take this one. Um, you, you try to have a brief, constructive, positive conversation. You don't want to get into explanation of judgment calls or things like that, but you have to communicate in a way, uh, use good communication skills so that it doesn't sound like you're trying to be argumentative or confrontational, but simply explain to the coach that, look, you know, right at the moment, if it's between periods, that you really do need to go you know, to your locker room to, you know, get, 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 get things together. And that if it really be something serious, that you'd be happy to talk with them at the end of the game in a, in a situ in a quiet place, be it wherever that may be. You don't want to start again. You don't want to create a confrontational situation in a, in a public area with everyone watching and trying to you know, win the debate, so to speak. And I think, uh, Oh, go ahead, Al. Um, my experience with that is when I coached in the North American Hockey League for 10 years, and it goes to the communication between the coach and the officials, uh, either within the league or the game, is that when is the appropriate time to, to discuss an issue? Obviously, you have the on ice, 
And what we had at that time was that there was no discussion between periods. And if there was a pop, and if you had a, an issue after the game, you put it in writing and you submitted it to the referee supervisor. We eliminated that, that verbal confrontation whatsoever. Now in youth hockey, I'm, I'm not sure, but again, I think it's establishing the guideline is when the official and the coach can communicate. It's like a coach with his parents. He decides when he's available to, 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 to speak to parents and under what conditions uh, those, those uh, discussions take place. No, for sure. And, and Matt, next week on the Zoomcast, what's the topic of next week's Zoomcast? It is communication. Communication with coaches. That's right. Yes. So that's our, that's our, that's our yeah. teaser. And Scott, if I can just add one more thing too to this lost time thing, because I see it's generated a, a few things as the chats. Uh, the uh, multiple chats are, are, are flying through our screens here and it's, it's difficult to keep up. Uh, look, I get it. I get there's a concern that a team's winning by one goal with three minutes left in the game. Okay, and allegedly they're gonna have their parents go crazy in order to have the clock run out. I get that. Okay, but seriously, that's what youth hockey has come to. If that's what youth hockey's come to, we have a much, much bigger problem than what we're dealing with here. And I would say that any time, absolutely any time, that the parent spectators have impacted the game to the point where the official feels that they need to stop that game and run the clock, that official is filing a, a report through the game reporting system, okay, under other incident. And they are notifying the proper authorities of the actions of that team and or those parents. And I will, I will, I can't guarantee, but I know certainly from a USA hockey perspective, if that report goes to the affiliate and the affiliate finds out that that team created that situation intentionally to compromise the integrity of the game. Okay. That coach and or that association is probably going to be suspended for a very long time. Okay, so let's be realistic here. We can go back. We can't have it both ways as officials. We can't accept the abuse. We can't not acknowledge the inappropriate actions, okay, because we feel that it may compromise the integrity of the game. But at the same time, we have to be able to address what it is. We can't predict why, what the motives are or anything else. All we could do is react to the actions that occur out on the ice and properly enforce the rules and follow the proper procedures that are outlined by USA Hockey. Anything else that comes above that, whether it's a major penalty in a game misconduct, whether it's a match penalty, or whether it's spectator abuse, that falls into the hands of the proper authorities for them to deal with. That's out of our hands. We have simply done what we are expected to do in terms of enforcing the rules and the policies of USA Hockey. And, and I want to emphasize what, what, what one part of what Matt just said, and that is it's so important that if the officials have to uh, take action because of spectators' uh, behavior in the stands, that report, that incident report has got to be filed. Because if we don't know about it, we being the administrators or the proper disciplinary authority, we can't do anything about it. So I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, and, and, and that's really true. I mean, you, you, you can't fix what you don't know about and you can't address it. And, and I know we've all had times where things happen and I, I'm, I'm the parent of a, a 14 year old, I'm sorry, he's now 15 year old referee. And, and certainly he's had challenges at times too. And, and, you know, if you don't report it, you don't know about it. And, and the different associations can't take care of it. Here's, here's a good one in that regard. Uh, in terms of hateful, abusive, uh, discriminatory language, what does an official do if they're not sure about that? Like they're not sure if that language crosses the line. What do they do and how do they handle it? Do they assess the match penalty or not? This, this, is, this has been an ongoing discussion with regards to this particular uh, rule. Look, you know, um, we're a very diverse organization and the diversity is basically based on the geography of the country. Um, what is what falls into those categories in one part of the country may not necessarily be fall into that same category in another part of the country. 
Um, we have to use what we is our best understanding of what is in those categories in the geography that we operate or live in. Um, I wish I could be more specific. I think there are some things though that are fairly universal. Uh, we don't need to go through them here because I'm not going to go through my George Carlin routine. Um, but with that being said, I mean, if you, I mean, if your gut reaction is that that falls in that rule, then you call it and report it and let the appropriate disciplinary authorities deal with it. Uh, perfect. And, and that, and that's right. And, and once again, that falls under the, if they don't know about it, they can't address it. Um, Al, we've, as I, as I look through um, some of these comments, I see a lot of comments about, you know what, it's not really the parents right now, it's the co or it's not really the coaches that are the problem, it's the parents. How do we deal with that? In, in my experience, and once again, I'll go back to my level two working might squirt and peewee hockey only at this point in time. When issues arrive and you address it with the coach right away, he's gonna do everything in his power to address it with that parent. Agree? I, I agree. And again, um, I'll be listening into your communications next weekend. But again, it's all about communication. And I coached in youth hockey for many, many years. And, and even at junior hockey, we had um, uh, discussions uh, with our spectator behavior. And if, if the coach lays out the expectation of the parents and, and tells the parents, look, your, your bad behavior is going to hurt our hockey team. Um, and, and it becomes a distraction to our players. And so, you know, get on board with us and help us be as good a hockey team as we can be. And I think it all, we put a lot of, of, of responsibility on the coach, but that's what he or she is there for. They set the tone, they are the role model, and they set the expectation of behavior of that team, both on and off the ice, players and parents and staff. Has there a... Uh... Has there ever been any thought in the coaching side of things to having the coaches take a uh, take a rules test as no. part of their certification? No. Okay. <laughs> fair, fair enough. And I and once no, again, but we, we we do encourage. And in fact, I think Matt will recall back in the days when I was national coach and chief, we like to have joint meetings with the officials during the uh, annual congress and the and the winter meetings. And I don't know if we're doing that as much as we should. And we are inviting the officials or our official representative to come to our coaching clinics, particularly at the three, four, and the five. Um, and those are things that I think uh, we need to continue to do, if maybe not do more of. And also in part of our <clears throat> uh, advanced clinics, particularly the three, four, and five, we do tell the ch coaches that they have to understand the rules, particularly when we went into the, the, the checking rules. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding or was a lot of misunderstanding about that and we've worked within our clinics to emphasize um, what what is acceptable and what is not uh, that that's great Dave and, and Scott uh, if I could uh, just mention there has been conversation in the past also to reverse that experience and have officials behind be behind the bench for us for a few games because in all honesty you don't understand the problem until you experience it. And that I think might bring another perspective to an official and the communication skills and the level of communication that is needed when a coach wants to know something. Uh, that, that, that's great. And you're, and you're right. And it is, I've stood behind the bench um, at the USHL level a couple of years ago during a game. Um, and it, it, it's interesting when you're trying to get an official's attention and, and maybe they don't see you and all of those things, it, it, it certainly is a different perspective. So um, as we, we close in on the top of the hour, I've got two more questions here for you guys. And uh, I, I, they were actually emailed in ahead of time. And, and I think they're both, they're both challenging questions. So we're gonna put you on the spot a little bit here. So, so here's the first one. What does zero tolerance mean to you guys? New officials have no benchmarks, and veteran officials just want to get the game over with and ignore the underlying issues of abuse, which sets the table for further abuse. So I'll ask again, what does zero tolerance mean? For me, zero tolerance means mutual respect by, by everybody involved in the game. 
And that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean dis, not disagreeing, but disagreeing in a respectful way. And then once the disagreement is heard through, move on with the game. Um, the question is, in a lot of ways, represents all of the problems and issues we have to address. Um, in the ideal world, every every player and every coach would be out there trying to play the game to their best of their ability to win the game, but accept the fact that there may come a time in which the other team simply plays better. It's not the official's fault that they lost the game, no matter what is, is used as an excuse. Same thing with officials. You know, nowadays, uh, I don't think it's any secret. The game has expanded faster than we've been able to train uh, our officials, and therefore there's a shortage of officials. Officials go out there and they're working too many games in a day or in a weekend. And let's face it, psychologically, they're probably not doing the best job they can. Even if they are physically tired, if they go out and give it their best effort, my guess is, is that they'll, they'll do a respectable job. But at the same point in time, officials go out there simply to skate up and down to be able to collect the game fee are the officials that really create the problems for the rest of the officiating community. Matt? I, I certainly agree with that. And to me, there's a couple of things here. There's a, there was a lot of rules in place uh, over the years. The rule book has been worked on for several years and revised and updated is to get administrators um, and officials and coaches to enforce the rules that are in place. And sometimes we get a little bit lazy. Um, and I think the zero tolerance policy is a reminder that we want to enforce the rules that are in place. And also as a reminder of the player safety, fair play and respect. Uh, we've had to put some stronger language in there um, on the diversity and inclusion. And because of this retention committee that we're a part of, we put some language in there that maybe enforces um, the respect, uh, particularly to officials. And uh, But the zero tolerance may basically means follow the rules in place, be of good character, respect, and discipline. And then, and then finally, here's, here's the last question, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw this to you, Matt. Um, as an organization, why do we tolerate unsportsmanlike conduct? USA Hockey standard of play in Rule 601 call for zero tolerance. That seems to be very explicit in that it's not a 10% or 2% policy. Why then do we allow coaches and parents to verbally attack officials with no consequences? It's not unthinkable that young officials would be in the stands watching a game and he sees a veteran official allowing a coach to yell and be abusive so he feels that he must also allow it. We're already losing half of our officials every year to the verbal abuse. Zero tolerance must be legitimately mean that. There'll be a learning curve, but halfway through the season, people will adjust. What are your thoughts? First of all, I think that that's a, that's a great question, even though it was maybe a little bit on the lengthy side. But with <laughs> that being said, why are we here? Okay, we're here because USA Hockey is making a commitment, okay, organizationally to address this particular issue. And yes, there has been some long-standing cultural things within USA Hockey that has been acceptable that quite frankly, based on the information you're given tonight, it's no longer acceptable. Okay, and we have a, a updated zero tolerance policy and Scott touched on some of the main things of that, but there's other things that are involved with that that have been proposed for our board of directors to adopt on Saturday, okay? And that will be part of um, the language and part of the information that goes out from an education program uh, moving forward. But at this particular juncture, if you're part of this particular seminar or webcast tonight, okay, you no longer have the excuse not to properly enforce the rules whether it be under the zero tolerance policy, whether it be rule 601, okay, or whether it be any of the other rules that are in the book. Our role as the officials is to enforce the rules of the game to the best of our ability, period. That is our job, okay? That is our role and USA Hockey expects that. Now, if you understand or if you remember, we implemented the Declaration of Fair Play um, safety or player safety, fair play and respect last season, prior to last season. 
okay? And there was an impact. It didn't happen overnight, okay? Immediately when the season started, the players didn't play perfectly. And there's still going to be some dinosaurs that are out there that are going to be believing that, um, you know, that to punish the opponent or intimidate them is, is part of the game or to hit someone five seconds after he releases, he or she releases the puck, that's fair game because all you're doing is finishing the check. Okay, but if you went out and you watched hockey last season and you did your job as an official to properly enforce the rules, I would like to think that you probably saw an improvement in the way the game was played and it became less of an issue as the season went on. I know I did. I followed two sons. Okay, I saw games in, in 12 different states last season. Okay, watched youth hockey games in 12 different states. Okay, and as the season progressed, the game got better. It's the same thing here. We are now giving you, USA Hockey is giving you the official. Okay, another, okay, reinforced tool to go in your toolbox. Now you have the obligation to develop the skill set that you need to properly apply and properly utilize that tool with the proper enforcement of the rules. That's up to you. And you will have, yes, you're gonna have some local people that are gonna have some pushback initially. Okay, that's part of it. That's, that's part of the nature of a large volunteer-based organization with 600,000 members and 25,000 officials and 40,000 teams that are probably playing 40,000 games on any given weekend. It's not going to be perfect at first. It's not going to be ideal. But the more that we do our job in properly enforcing the rules and using the tools that are available to us, the better chance we have of changing that culture. And that's the challenge that you have. And that's the challenge that USA Hockey is going to continue to commit to as it develops continuing or additional resources and as it tries to educate coaches and parents and players and everyone else who loves this game and has a passion for the game. But we want to change the culture. We want to change the culture from a player safety standpoint as it relates to dangerous actions. We want to change the culture as it relates to unsportsmanlike behavior. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. But you're going to play a role in that. And one of the ways that you play a role in that is by controlling your emotions and controlling those things that you personally have control over, okay? And that's rule knowledge. It's the proper application of the rules. That's controlling your emotions. That's being able to develop a skill set to properly communicate and de-escalate situations to make the game go better. Because our goal is to make a positive environment and a fun, competitive environment for all participants. That includes players, that includes coaches, that includes spectators, and most importantly, in our profession or in our area, that includes the officials as well. That, that, that's great, and, and I think that's a, a really good message. Um, Al, as we begin to wrap this up, anything you want to uh, say in closing? Yeah, I, I think the thing that I'm watching a lot of the chat uh, questions here, and I think the thing that we need to make sure that we understand is 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 a lot of these things are, are judgment calls on the, uh, and they have to make a, a split section a, a second decision on the part of the official i think the coaches need to understand that and as matt said it's not perfect and, and one of the things we've talked about a little bit it hasn't been real popular but i'll mention it here is that <clears throat> when do the officials get a chance to practice they they don't i mean Hockey teams, you know, we'll practice two or three times a week and then we play our games on the weekend. And one of the things we did in Montana a couple of years ago, and when I did it in with Coach Juniors, is we'd bring an official uh, out to our practices and let them officiate our scrimmages, let them officiate our small area games. Uh, maybe even as we went into our practices, when we did competitive drills, um, it got our players used to the official on the ice, and also it gave the official some on-ice experience with players. And I don't know that they have that experience. That their, their practice is the games. They don't, 
And so I think one way to improve officiating is to, to give them those opportunities to, to work with youth teams or junior teams in practices. Oh, for sure. And it's, it, and it, it's always a challenge. And that's one of the challenges as an official is to stay sharp and, and, and learn from those experiences. And once again, another, another Zoom cast we're going to be having here coming up very soon is, is uh, working with officiating coaches and, and supervision. Dave, anything uh, anything you want to add here in closing? I'll just leave the uh, the the group uh, with this thought. Um, I've I've been involved uh, in the game uh, and with USA Hockey for a very long time, um, and of that time, uh, 27 years of that was as an active on ice official. Uh, I'm going to pass on something that was told to me in my early years on the ice, um, advice that I was given as an official, and that is. When you get on the ice, um, you get on the ice with your striped jersey and your USA Hockey crest, you start out with a certain level of respect and credibility. But everything you do after that point will either add to that level of respect or it will take away from it. I think an overwhelming majority of the, the officials in USA Hockey are, are always going out there to try to do the best job they can and, and add to that level of respect and credibility. Um, and hopefully, with continuing discussions like this and the, the initiatives that USA Hockey is, is uh, putting in place, will create a, a better environment so that all officials can go out there, do the job, the best job they can, and have a good time. No, that, that, that's excellent. And, and I'm going to jump in and I'm going to just so we're clear, and it's been said in, in three different ways, and now I'm going to say it in a fourth. If you as an official conduct yourself in a, in a professional manner and you display a seriousness of purpose and you go out there and you have fun, there is no reason for you to be verbally abused. None whatsoever. And next week we are going to talk about communication and we are going to talk about giving warnings. But let's be clear, USA Hockey is behind this initiative. Coaches, parents, players are going to understand this initiative as well. There is going to be a renewed commitment to limiting the abuse officials take on the ice. So when you're out there, know that we are behind you as an organization and you do not need to be abused. So with that, I very much want to thank all of our participants for joining. We certainly hope you, you enjoyed the the presentation and I just want to remind you in the coming weeks we have a series of zoom casts every Tuesday night to talk about and I'm just going to scroll to it so coming up next Tuesday on the 16th we have communication with teams and coaches included in our guests and that are going to be not only Keith Caval, who is the director of officiating from the North American Hockey League and was a very successful official at the professional ranks and international ranks. We've got two coaches, one from a tier one youth team and Greg Moore from the Toronto Marlies of the American Hockey League. Uh, the following Tuesday, we've got a program on, uh, on mentor programs and why that is so important. As I referenced then following on the 30th, we've got coaching and supervision. And then finally, uh, on the 7th, we've got an officiating program update to let everybody in the officiating program know what initiatives are coming forward, different updates. Obviously, we're in some very strange times. Uh, what seminars may look like this coming season. Uh, hopefully, you're all registering right now and, and working on your modules and your, your testing. Um, seminars might look a little different, and, and certainly that's going to be something that gets covered a bit on July 7th. Uh, we've got a ton of other topics that'll be following those up, but those are the ones in the not too distant future. So I wanna thank you all again for participating. Thank you very much to Al, Matt, and Dave. Uh, we wish you, wish you peace and good health and look forward to seeing you all again next Tuesday night. Good evening, everyone. Hey, have a good night. Yep, good luck and have a great season.